Hello, everybody, and welcome to the podcast number 32. Uh, it's our last episode before Christmas, so I want to get the occasion to wish you Merry Christmas and to spend a good uh, Christmas days with your family if you have the occasion, or yeah, just enjoy the free time and these uh, weird days where most of the world is still in sort of a lockdown or some kind of restriction on measurements. Um, yeah, and of course the Creative Insider goes through the holidays, so there will be also before the New Year's Eve another episode. But um, in this episode, uh, it was very cool because it's our first threesome episode, <laughs> which means uh, there were two guests and they're from the same uh, um office they're from bureau b uh, which is a architectural office in um, switzerland which has a very particular story it's called uh, bureau b which means office b because it was uh, found from founded from architects which were considering their second employment and they were doing a lot of competitions and they won some so got more structured and nowadays it's a very established office in switzerland so it was a very interesting story to hear from two of the members of this office uh, christopher who is a partner and andreas who is a younger employee and his dad is partner in the office um so yeah enjoy the conversation you'll have the first insight from a swiss office and I wish you again Merry Christmas and we'll see each other on next Monday. For now, enjoy this conversation. But the whole world stops just like that. Hello, Andreas. Hello, Christopher. How are you guys? Excellent. Thank you. Very well. Thank you for having us. Uh, thank you for accepting my invitation. You're another. You're the first uh, guest, which are like we are doing doing the first three song podcast. <laughs> well, that's. It's always good to be new on something. Yeah, you're the first one. So uh, it's uh, nice that you accepted my invitation. You're another. Um, another podcast based on on social media because I found your work on on Instagram and then I had the pleasure to talk to Andreas. Um, so you guys are from Bureau B, right in Switzerland? Exactly. I was wondering about the name. How 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 about this name? Why why what is the B stands for? Well, maybe that's a question I should answer. Um, the office was founded about, oh, what was it, about uh, 30 years ago. So it's been around for quite a while. And at the time, um, there was this competition. Uh, in Switzerland, we have many competitions. And the office managed to win this competition. But all the people um, who actually... Um, well, uh, at the time, it was just a loose bunch of, of you know, students and workers somewhere else um, who sort of got together and they entered this competition or we entered this competition and we managed to win it. But everybody had had a had a main job somewhere, you know, either employed or working differently. So, you know, there's this saying that, you know, there's like a Bureau A and then there's a Bureau B. So... Um, we managed to win this at the time, but um, uh, or actually, I mean, I myself, I'm not a founding member, but at the time they managed to win this. And uh, so we had to create this office out of nowhere. And we just called it Bureau B because it wasn't our main occupation at the time. But since, obviously, it has become our main occupation. Um, that's a really cool story. So I, I guess the office started like a side hustle and... Um that's a lot of a lot of the architecture practices around the world starts like this exactly but um 
I'm curious, uh, you know, to start a little bit from from the beginning of your career as architects, because you're also like the first guest which I'm having from Switzerland. Um, so, what what guys was your education? How in in which point of your life uh, you thought I'm going to be an architect or a creative or a person connected to design and making things? Uh, yeah, should I start since you answered the previous question? Um, yeah, since my career uh, is uh, not that old yet, I, I, I still remember quite clearly um, there was like one moment in high school where there were students from different, uh, they were like studying different topics they came to our high school to present what they were studying and then we could go and uh, listen to what they were telling us about their uh, their studies and uh, I didn't really know what <laughs> what topic I should go for and uh, I was like going for economy and law and things like that and then there was like one more slot that I could uh, go and, and have a, have a look into and uh, didn't really know what I should go for and then I, I, I went for architecture and that was more kind of a lucky thing and uh, then this guy was like yeah telling us what they were doing in uh, in Zurich at ETH and it sounded like really interesting to me and uh, I, uh, that's that was really like a, a, a moment where I started to, to uh, being interested into architecture. Um, it wasn't like this like super, super, super moment where, where like everything like revealing itself, but I think it was a starting point. And um, then I, I decided to go and do my bachelor studies in, in Lausanne at EPFL. Um, uh, it was mainly because of, of, of the language. I thought it like it, it could be a good challenge to study in in uh, French. It's in like Lausanne, in the French part of Switzerland, and I grew up in Bern in the German part, German speaking part. And so I did three years in Lausanne. It was a, like, a really nice time. And then I did my master degree in Zurich because I thought like it would be good to have a change between bachelor and master and um, yeah after my graduation I I went to to London I moved to London to work for Caruso's engine because Adam Caruso was my um, professor at uh, in Zurich my diploma professor and after a few years in London I came back to Switzerland and started working for Bureau B where I'm still uh, today so Christopher, and what was your your background before before you joined the the Bureau B? Because you said you're not a founding partner, so I I guess there was some time before Bureau B for you too. Also, yeah, well, like your education wise. Yes, absolutely. Um, um, well, I I also um, I I went through the ETH in Zurich, the Swiss you know the Swiss Federal Polytechnic in Zurich. Um, but I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but in Switzerland we have these two, uh, like a dual educational system. We have a system of apprenticeships. So um, you can either go through high school, college, and then you can join one of the two Swiss Federal Polytechnics, either in Zurich or in Lausanne, or you go through an apprenticeship. You first learn a, a, a draftman's craft, and afterwards you go either to a different college or um, or you can also go to one of the Swiss uh, Federal Polytechnics. So I went to Zurich, um, I enjoyed that very much. And um, after Zurich, I, I did some work here in Bern and then I I went to work as, a, as an architect in London uh, in a very small practice called Clark Phillips Renner. Uh, I think they're, they're, they're now called just Clark and Renner, um, very fun. Very good practice, just off uh, just off Portobello Road. Enjoyed that very much, and then I came back here to Bern, and I uh, I joined Bureau B. And um, you guys both have been working in London for some times. 
Um, did you notice some major difference in the way of work uh, as an architect in England and as an architect in Switzerland? Uh, yeah, uh, good question. I think, <clears throat> well, probably very interesting to hear both answers because we, we've been to London in kind of different times. Um, for me, uh, yeah, I've been to London recently. And uh, I think the, the, the biggest difference was, was that it was a different practice. The practice who's like working a bit more in different style um in daily 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 business so um yeah i think the, that was the, that was the major difference and then <clears throat> about about like how work is being done in the country it's also i think that, that there is a difference it's maybe hard it's more and more hard to describe on one hand side i was i was doing projects in Germany when I was working in London and I guess German pro projects are in the way they're done it's more similar to how it's done in Switzerland and uh, about about uh, the way of working in England or the UK itself I think the biggest difference is that in the UK most or basically all projects are realized with a with a general uh, contractor and in switzerland it's what we try to avoid at <laughs> any cost let's say uh, that there's i think most good projects are done without a general contractor and in the uk that's the standard so i guess that that's what changes most the way of uh, how you how you do a project in an office. Um, if I might just come in here at this point, I think Andreas said something very important in terms of how we realize projects. Um, Swiss architecture has a, uh, I mean, in comparison to the size of Switzerland, has a has a quite a high standing internationally. And I think that's due to the fact that um, we, um, um, we have a, um, uh, a very high, long-standing tradition of of sort of craftsmanship in switzerland and it's still it's still educated in a very good way that's why i also mentioned before this sort of apprenticeship thing and um, we try to when we build projects or when we design projects we also always think of the building process and and we talk to the individual craftsmen. We learn an awful lot through, you know, through talking to carpenters or, or builders and everything. And we, we, um, as Andrea said, we try to avoid going through general contractors. Um, but we actually talk to craftsmen, and we we care a lot about detail. That's um, obviously a very Swiss thing to do. <laughs> but um, I think that's one of the main one of the main differences. We we follow up a building until it's actually built and we we go on site and we you know we correct stuff and everything so that's um it's very much of a craftsman's job but um what i was also wondering is um uh this is uh, specifically what you mentioned to me it's uh, sort of a a process difference but um do you think that the same design you do for maybe a Swiss project could be appreciated in England too. And um, if, for example, also the quality of of the building in the tile-wise, I mean, construction also quality, it's as high as, um, let's say, the I, I would say the German-speaking world because I think that uh, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland has have all of them have pretty high standards for the quality of construction um uh, if, if i can answer this first i think i think you have good craftsmanship all over the world and um that's that's one thing you just have to find it um and i think the design um is always something very local i mean we wouldn't do the same design in Bern as we would do somewhere else it it's just um every new location lends itself to to a new design and that's what makes our job so interesting 
Yeah, yeah, I, I think, could agree with that. Um, I think, yeah, the design, of course, it it uh, it, uh, it adjusts to 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 local circumstances, but also I do think in the UK it, or I would say in the UK it it might be more difficult to have a, to realize a good craftsmanship, not because the good craftsmen would be would be unexisting, but more because uh, the the usual process of building is going through this 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 general contractor thing uh, that that makes it more like much much harder to to realize the the quality uh, the, that you as an architect want to achieve. And in Switzerland, this this more straightforward direct approach with this where, where we have an exchange and more control over the craftsmanship it it i do think it helps to to achieve a higher quality and um i'm curious also andreas you you first of all guys how old are you i don't, I don't know that i haven't asked you that and i'm gonna go with that <laughs> yeah I, <laughs> i'm 32 I'm 54. Okay, so it's good to uh, know, Christopher. <laughs> I'm 20. I'm 28. All oh, right. Oh, excellent. That's so good. Yeah, I, I think uh, for sure all of your employees gonna listen to this podcast for the simple fact that uh, Christopher is on. So it's uh, <laughs> somebody <laughs> external has the opportunity to <laughs> well to roast to roast a little bit the boss. <laughs> Absolutely, and they'll be bringing me crutches into the office and stuff, you know. <laughs> uh, and I, I was uh, wondering uh, when did you join uh, Bureau B and. Um, because I've worked before in in an office uh, here in Frankfurt, where I joined the office uh, in a very you know historical moment for the office, because uh, the founding partners were retiring and new partners uh, were taking on the office, and um, I was very curious how it works such a such a thing. So I was curious, like if you, if you, if it's nothing secret, if you could tell me a little bit more about how you joined and how was the process before you have been offered the opportunity to, to become a partner and then managing partner as you are right now. Right, um, I will gladly do so. Well, I, as I said, I was in London, and and I came back to Bern. Um, uh, well, I mean, for reasons of love. And uh, I was looking for a, a company, and I I, um, I I called Bureau B, and I was here. I was working here for a short while, all through I think 1999, which happens to be a great Prince album. And then I um, I I did a you know a couple of other things. I worked uh, on one or two competitions besides the office, and then I decided um, well maybe you know do something else. And I, um, I spoke to the partners and said I, I was going to quit the office, and that's when they offered me a partnership, and uh, and I decided to come a, to become a partner. Mm. But um, when you are joining an office as a partner, um, I don't know. Do they sell you part of the company, or you join just is there like what is the process? Because it's to me this part is. Right. I mean, at some big companies, uh, for example, I'm currently working at a big, very big company, one of the biggest, and they're also uh, on the stock. So you probably just need to buy some stocks and then you're in. But I was wondering in a smaller office, how, how is the, the process? Well, I mean, let me put this into perspective. I mean, if you're a B is a is a company we employ um or we've been employing between 30 and at times 50 um architects over the last i'd say 20 years um so we we are that sort of size we're not a huge company um but we're not a very small company either 
And um, so at the at the moment we are five partners. We once we were four partners. Um, that varies a bit. So. Um, Yes, I mean, when you become a partner, you have to buy in, uh, you have to buy shares. Um, um, uh, but, you know, you can do that through different financial systems. Um, and uh, But yes, it's important, I think, as a partner to be part of the business as well, not just an architect, uh, but also be part of the business and feel that, um, that you own part of the business. I think that's an... Um, that's a very important factor. Um, so that's that's um, that's what you do, and um, uh, yes. And after that, it's mainly, I think, uh, something. As always, it it also has to click on a on a human scale. You know, you have to have, um, I think, similar interest in architecture. You have to speak a, a similar language. You 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 have to have worked together. Um, and things have to click on a on a out of work scale as well. I think so. Um, yeah, that's um, that's essentially what it what it takes. And the size of the office has been constant through the years, or um, when you started, you started to say nineteen ninety nine, if I understood correctly. Mm. And was it back then still smaller, and then grew in the last two decades, let's say? Mm. Well. Um, Like like many many companies in Switzerland, um, Bureau B actually acquires its work through competitions. Um, I'd say over ninety percent of our annual budget is work that we acquire by having been lucky in winning a competition. Um, so sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. So obviously. Um, the size of the company varies a bit in terms of, of you know just how how many competitions you've won. But we've been we've always been between thirty and fifty over the last twenty years. So that's that's just about um, very you know where it goes. Um, and also we're not really I don't, I don't know we're not really businessmen. We're just architects. Um, Uh, we like to work as architects. We don't have a big business plan in terms of, yes, we want to we want to get bigger or smaller or whatever. Um, we don't go and and look for work by talking to other businesses. We just do our competitions, and sometimes we're lucky, and sometimes we're not. And uh, you, Andreas, how did you find about uh, Bureau B? Did you already knew the company? Uh, while you were in England, uh, and uh, what attracted you to 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 go to try out Bureau B? Um, yeah, that's a, a question I can answer to quite easily. I know the office basically since I'm born because my dad is one of the founding members, found, founding partners, and um, uh, yeah, so. I, I always had somehow a connection to this office, and uh, but at the same time, I must say I probably for never really thought I would work for this office because I mean, even though I have a, 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 a very good relation to my dad, I think it was kind of a mutual agreement that he's doing his thing and I would be doing my thing. And so I also, when I did an internship, I did go to another practice. And when I was looking for my first job after my graduation, I didn't ask Bureau Bay, but I did go to London. And um, <clears throat> But things happened that uh, at one point when I was still working and living in London, I was uh, I was telling my parents that I was thinking about moving back within maybe next six months or so. And then it happened that Bureau Bay won a competition uh, in Bern, in the very center of Bern, for a new access to the train station of Bern. And so it's a very interesting project due to its position within the city and due to its importance to further developments of the city. 
and so he told me if if, if I was interested and if uh, I would be capable to join within like half a year or so, I I, I, I could be working on that project and maybe also uh, take uh, an important position. And uh, that that was actually the first time when the question uh, of working for Bureau Bay came up in a, in like a serious manner. And then I, I decided to to go for it and uh, take this position and and work on this project. Uh, in a way, I was also happy because beforehand I just didn't know how to decide of where to go and and where to work or who to work for. So I I was like thinking of going to Zurich or maybe Basel or maybe Lausanne or <clears throat> and Bern. Of course, it was an option because my family is based here, but but. But maybe less because of the of the offices who are who are based in Bern, and then yeah, when I decided to go for this project for the train station, it it basically it it answered all of the other questions. So I moved to Bern, and I didn't have to decide of which city I should choose and which practice. And uh, I guess in the end, or, or at least today. It, I, I'm quite happy about this decision. It's like two, two and a half years that I'm at Bureau Bay and it's going well and working with Christopher and I do think we're a good team and the, the project is, is obviously sometimes a pain, but in general, it's great fun. <laughs> well, I think it's also like, you know, I, I was, while you were telling this little story, I was thinking also that Everybody as a kid sees in their dad or like in their parents uh, sort of, you know, an example, a hero. So it must have been also cool, like professionally to to join the same office where where your parents were were working. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's it, uh, it. There is a, a certain or maybe actually quite a big satisfaction if uh, it's possible to work with with its own dad and and you see that it's going well you know it's also that there's of, of course there's a certain risk to it that i uh I, although we both were aware of in the beginning um and then when you realize that it's going well and that that, that it's 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 like a, a good exchange and it's an enriching exchange it that there is a quite a big satisfaction to it, um, but it, at the same time, it, it it wasn't the aim to to work together. You know, it's it's, it's more it's, it's something that happened because the circumstances were right, and I think that that helped a lot because there was just no pressure. You know, there was like <clears throat> uh, since since we both kind of knew that it could happen, but it doesn't have to, that we work together, that that, that made things quite relaxed. And, uh, and so it, it was like a positive approach. I, I uh, come for originally from Bulgaria and then I grew up in Italy. And uh, those countries are uh, like the people in both countries are very emotional and very, you know, uh, warm blooded. And um, I was, I'm curious to know, because you said you didn't feel pressure, but was there any pressure, like peer pressure from your colleagues, because you were the son, like of one of the leaders in the office that you needed to prove actually that you uh, belong to the office or is that uh, in Switzerland, something that doesn't happen? <laughs> well, I, I don't know if, if I can make a like national case out of of, of my own uh, experience um but like on a personal level i can i can tell you that um it went very quick i think in the, in, in the beginning in my first few months in the office that uh like yeah you of course you need some time to settle and and, and find your position and and I think very quickly it was very normal and 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 uh, like for, for for everyone that that I was there and that I was the son of of one of the founding partners. 
and it, it wasn't a big deal. And I do think quite quickly I was I was judged about like uh, what I was doing and uh, I was uh, what, what was I delivering and and about my yeah, my personality in the office and what was I what was what I was bringing into the office and not about like my 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 position as a son of one of the founding partners. I think it didn't take long that uh, it became quite self evident. Okay, that's that's an, a nice thing. I was just curious because uh, you know uh, that's stuff that, that that I've seen in my life. So I was curious because sometimes people don't see uh, both sides of a story. Because as I told you myself, I was thinking that it must have been uh, cool to join the office of your dad. But as um, Christopher, you mentioned, you do a lot of um, competition, and um, I was uh, thinking that by now you you must have some little name up in the competition world in Switzerland because for so many years you might have won a capo, let's say. Um, do you participate uh, mostly open competitions or in, like with an inv invitation or you do both or how do you find the competition you take part at? Um, no, that's a very good question, Georgi. Um it's um, we do all sorts of competitions. Uh, obviously, uh, we are invited into competitions, um, and then there are there's a form of competition where it's it's an open one, but you have to sort of pre you have to sort of pre qualify. Um, we do lots of those, but we also like to enter open competitions. Um, so the actual form of competition doesn't really it doesn't really bother us too much. Um, uh, it's um uh, especially as a partner when you work in competitions you work in competitions uh in the evening after hours or or on the weekend so you have to want to do this competition there's a lost uh, there's a lost component in all this you know you have to um you have to be uh, enthralled by the the situation you know by the by the actual possibility of the project and um, uh, so that's really one of the main reasons obviously if we can we like to work locally because it's just a lot easier um, but also we just you know it's it's the actual um, it's the actual idea something that clicks in you that says you know I want to do this competition and then you just go on ahead and do it and not worry about the form you know of the competition too much obviously if we're invited somewhere, um, which which happens quite often, um, you know, we like to think about it, but uh, um, it it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really it doesn't really bother us too much. And um, I'm also curious about your um, sort of uh, design process and design organization, because you said you're not uh, very much business oriented, more architecture oriented. But still, every organization has some sort of hierarchy. So um, I was wondering if, like you said, you're five partners. Uh, if you partners divide the projects you're responsible for, and then if there is like a project leader, or if there is a general design manager or design director, how that part wor part works? Well, it it starts off. It starts off with the partners because obviously we decide on on the, which which competitions we're going to enter and which not, and uh, so there's always one partner who's like um, uh, the main partner on the project uh, or on the competition, and there's always a second partner um, who's who's in the competition as well, a lot more than the other uh, three partners. Um, so um, it's always. Well, I mean, there are always two partners working on the competition, and uh, we start off with uh, one employee working on the competition, one or two, sort of depending on the size, and that's like the core team of the competition. And then we discuss it with all the other partners and uh, and other people. Um, and then, uh, as the competition goes on, we we normally start to panic, and we put a lot more people onto it, and. Uh, and uh, in the end, we somehow managed to hand in a hand in a hand in a project. Yeah. 
and um, how much of the how, how which what is the amount of the team that works on competition and uh, what is the amount of people that works on further phases of the project let's say um, well normally we have like um, we don't actually uh, in our company we don't sort of divide between design and uh, realization teams obviously every um, person has has their own tendencies you know there are people who prefer to work on designs um, and there are people who prefer to work on constructions um, uh, to put it a bit bluntly um, but I'd say normally we have a design team of you know I don't know between five and six people and um, and we have a uh, project teams you know between 30 35 people yeah and are a lot of the competition uh in i don't know what kind of competitions they are but um uh, do you automatically win also the realization of the building or it might happen that your design won but some other office will happen to continue with the rest of the of the process let's say Right, so so there we enter this discussion we've had earlier on. Um, we try to do competitions where we have one hundred percent of the architectural um, contract. That means that we do the design work plus the whole realization of this of this project. Sometimes uh, we enter competitions where we know there'll be the there will be a general contractor, so we just sort of do the design pro uh, we just do the design process but that's the absolute minimum we we will never enter competitions where we um, know that we only go to a certain to a certain degree we only enter competitions where we know that we can actually plan all the details and um, uh, we might not be able to um, to sort of put them to tender and stuff, but uh, we will always be able to plan the details. Mm. I see. And uh, Andreas, how about you? Where in this uh, sort of process is your is your current uh, position in the office? What are your tasks and what do you manage in the project process or in the architectural process at uh, Bureau B? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, well, since, since I started here in the office two and a half years ago, I, I'm working on this project for the train station in Bern. And that's I'm sometimes more, uh, more intense and sometimes less. And so we, we did hand it in a, a planning application uh, almost a year ago. And so uh, we... We are now in the third phases with like making tender packages. Uh, there, there we have the first tender packages going out soon. And so but then, yeah, and we're working within a team and um, mainly on the topics that concern like the, the client side and design, uh, design topics. And whenever the project allows to, to, to not work fully on the train station project. I do uh, I do work on competitions. So now this year, I I did work on on two or three competitions, and and currently, uh, yeah, I just started on another one uh, for the University of Bern. And so I I have quite a good balance between. A running project and, and a competition project. Well, like, you know, good balance means in terms of like, a, uh, I do think it's interesting to work simultaneously on different projects that are in different stages. It's maybe it's maybe not good for the workload, but <laughs> <laughs> intellectually, it, it, it uh, it's interesting. Christopher, there was a hidden message to you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely no, but I, it, Andreas is very is very capable of handling his workload. I think, yeah, no, no, but uh, I I know what you mean. But I mean, what's um, 
What's your experience with competitions? I mean, it's always, we just know the Swiss world so well. We have a very, very good system of competitions here. It's very intact. It's, uh, it allows lots of young architects also to, to find projects, you know, to win a competition, to, to start companies. Um, we, I, I think, you know, it's. I mean, it's fair to say that in Switzerland, we're really quite proud of of the intactness and and the way we handle competitions. And um, uh, it's, you know, it's a it's a it's a really good system that we know so well. But um, I personally have not um, had an awful lot of experience with competitions when I was working in in England. And um, I'd be curious to know. I mean, what's it? What's it like for you, Georgi? I mean, do you do lots of competitions? Um, so I started my career as most of the architects in the competition world. <laughs> right, of course, yes. <laughs> because, um, yeah, my story is a little funny because I, I, as I, as I told you before, I grew up in Italy. Uh, so I have this uh, duality in, in my persona. Mm. And um, Italy, I studied in Rome, so in, in oh, central right. Italy. So with little. not, yeah. So with not a lot of contact to to the central Europe, so so to say, it's not like Milano, which is like a couple of hours or even an hour away from Switzerland. Um, and uh, I decided to to go to take part in this Erasmus experience, and it ended up to to be in Frankfurt. And then when I arrived here, I studied a little bit of German because I figured out that there are a lot of positions. And then I started working in this um, competition and feasibility teams. Uh, so um, I worked in an office which was uh, mid-size as yours. It was around 45, 50 employees. And um, they were focused um, mostly on execution so they were more builders but they had uh, this design team because the new partners as i said wanted to make it also a little bit more design oriented and uh, we took part mainly uh, in 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 invited uh, competitions because uh, their focus was also you know not lose money on competitions because of course when you when you work on competitions for, we all know it's long hours. Uh, sometimes it's a quite large team for a project with four or five people. And also uh, you, I don't know how it's at your office, but you spend also money on, for example, external uh, visualizations and feasibility studies from from engineers and everything yeah. that you need to, to hand. So um, um, they were doing some competitions, which uh, we did a couple of competitions, which were very exciting. We we did uh, for bigger buildings. We did for the European Academy of the of Work, it's which is now already built. We did third place, and then mostly we did um, a lot of competitions for. Um, new residential complexes, and we want a couple of them. Um, and we we were lucky enough that we were this very you know uh, affirmed company in in the area of Frankfurt with execution. So then the office acquired uh, these um, these big projects, and then I moved to for in the beginning of the year. I moved to another office. Uh, which uh, is based here in Frankfurt. I'm, I'm not saying the names of the offices because, of course, uh, of course I don't feel yes. like mm. talking on uh, on the side of the name of those offices. I'm not part of them anymore. Uh, and in this other office, this was, you know, I was thinking uh, it's a very high-end uh, design office. And it was. But the thing was that the system uh, of competitions in that office was that we had the design team and the sort of... Um, head of design which was in charge of together with the partners for for all the design decisions and then i was part of the the wheel so to say to make it happen when it was about to be built and um and currently i'm working in the further phases of the project 
right. but I but I always look around um, for. I have my uh, sort of my own bureau bay, so my sort of I always uh, look around for some open competitions, mm. uh, which I could uh, take part on because I. I think it's important as an architect to also, you know, keep uh, in training your um, design spirit. And uh, sometimes in the workday, you're focused too much on solving some more detailed problem about the building. In my case, at least it's like this. And <laughs> um, and uh, you, you might lose track of your general creativity about uh, buildings and uh, yeah, design thinking and design process. So, yes, and- I think that's uh, I think that's very true. I mean, there's like um, several things we could say here, but I mean, one is that um, I mean we're all so fortunate to be in a in a job that uh, allows you to work on such different aspects and different scales. I mean, there's there's nothing more pleasing than than spending the morning working on in a scale of one to one thousand, one to one five hundred. And uh, and then in in the afternoon you're talking with a with a craftsman about a a one to one detail and and how to um, you know how to design this certain uh, element of a I don't know of whatever um, and uh, it's so it, it's it's I mean that's so gratifying that's uh, that's one point and there's these there's these different aspects of our job there's the design aspect. And, and there's the actual, you know, you have to be able to build it aspect. Um, and um, that's, uh, I mean, that's a great thing to do. But also, um, when you do these competitions, I think it's important that you, um, uh, I mean, to put this into perspective, um, if we enter a competition, um, we spend anything between, I'd say, 80,000 and 120,000 Swiss francs on this one competition, just by the amount of work we actually put into it. Um, so obviously, if we lose it, that's a lot of money lost. But if we win it, that's good. Um, but that's normal. That's what any company does here in Switzerland. Because you can't enter a competition half-heartedly. It's not something you can do on the side. You have to just, you know, you have to do it full. Otherwise, you'll never win because the competition is just too good. Um, and also, it's a, it's a sort of... It's um, it's a research thing. It's always important to pitch yourself against other um, really good companies uh, doing the same, you know, doing the same job, and just to see who comes up with what sort of solution. It's um, it's also a great aspect of those of those competitions. And um, um, I'm curious, usually, how how long time you have between the moment you are joining the competition officially and the handing date? Uh, it's roughly about three months. Okay, so in the in in the numbers you were saying it includes like three months work of your employees plus yes. just making the office uh, yeah. um, in a in a state that it can you can work. Yeah, I mean sometimes I mean sometimes you have, you know, like really big competitions and they go on for I don't know what, seven, eight months and you have various uh, various presentations you have to do and stuff. But um uh I mean you have to have it's uh, sort of a you know, this the the Swiss Federation of Architects stipulates that you uh, you have to have at least three months of of work on this uh you have to be allowed three months uh, to be able to hand in a project. Yeah. And have you taken part exclusively on Swiss competitions, or also I don't know German or Austrian ones too, or anywhere else in the world? Um, we well, we mainly did uh, Swiss competitions. Um, I think once or twice, but that's a while ago. I mean, I myself entered uh, international competitions, um, but uh, as uh, Bureau B, we just we try and concentrate on on Swiss competitions. Yeah. And um, I was wondering, Andreas, you said because you worked um, in two different phases of uh, the project, um, do you think that 
uh, working in the um, more executive phase and then the design phase. Uh, it's sort of uh, helping each other because you have also a lot of knowledge about uh, maybe some detail that you can make the sort of the, the sprout of your idea, so to say, in a competition. Um, yeah, <clears throat> sorry, I, I definitely think it's it's in, enriching. And uh, I think, well, the, the difficulty is to have enough like time and, and also like capacity um, that's mainly mentally, main, mental capacity to to engage enough into what you're doing. So, if if, if there's a good balance between two projects in different phases, and can be definitely enriching. If it's the case that you like in both in both projects, you don't manage to deliver the results you expect yourself, then. I guess there's a there's a risk that it's that it is damaging, but well, that's something I think you have to to handle yourself, and you have to find your the right way of of dealing with with different tasks that are that are, are set. And I was uh, also wondering if you at your practice. Um have um, um, a democratic way of um, designing, so to say, that when there is an idea that everybody can, I don't know, dis you discuss it together or it's more like a practice where the idea comes from above and then gets developed in detail. Oh, that's a very that's a very tricky question. I th I think I should let Andreas answer that yeah, one first. I, I was just wondering if it's that's one for me. <laughs> no, but I mean because, uh, for example, I have experienced uh, that. For example, sometimes um, we have uh, an idea in the office, and uh, which, of course, the, the 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 rough idea, the the general, the the big, the the larger plan. Um, comes from above generally because of course the partners are the one who join the competition and have first information and have first ideas and also have the experience to set the direction but, but it happened to me many times that for example uh, I've had contributed with some idea inside the project which was for example initially refused and then uh, after some time for processing it was back in the back in the game and um i've um for example i've uh, um there are, you know a lot of architects as um star architects which have these remarkable lines of their architecture so to maintain this sort of label it's impossible to accept democratic design because it needs to be sort of label conform and i was wondering because your pro when I look at your projects uh, uh, in your on your website, no matter what kind of building it, building it is, it looks to me you don't um, and and say this as a positive, you don't have a exact style. Let's say it's very clean design as general Swiss design is, but you don't you 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 seem pretty uh, be driven by. Um, the subject and the location, I say. Yeah, well, I could say, in in my experience, there's no bigger plan. <laughs> and I would, I, I, I do think this is, it, well, as you said before, it's a positive thing. There's not just like one idea that that has to be followed, and uh, in the same time, I I think there is like the. The, the total democracy in like finding the right or like choosing a, a path to follow or an idea to follow the, the total democracy doesn't exist of course there's the the word of the boss always counts a bit more than your own but um yeah between between 
total democracy and um, the, 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 the bigger plan there, there's like a, a huge range which can vary from, from, from competition to competition and from project to project. And also, I think, well, the, the better your own idea as an employee is, the, 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 the more you're heard and the more your own ideas can be like be transported into, into a competition. Um, I think it's, uh, that's an important sort of question you're asking, Georgi. Um, you know, if you put this into sort of historical context, you have figures like uh, Frank Lloyd Wright or like uh, Le Corbusier, who are very much the one-man show sort of office or you have figures like you know Walter Gropius who who always managed to build teams and you never really know where the actual ideas originated and um, um, I mean because we're always you know between four and f well five partners um, we um, we're used to, we're accustomed to work together even as partners, and um, uh, we're, we're accustomed that we have to discuss ideas. And um, we like to think that um, we're open to ideas of, of everybody working on this design and that we like to discuss those ideas. Sometimes, it's, um, sometimes we manage, sometimes we don't. Um, and I would very much agree with what Andrea said. It's, um, you know, sometimes you come to a point where you have to decide between this strategy or the other strategy. And it's important um, to just decide on one of those strategies and then follow it through as good as possible or as, as extreme or as radical as possible. And, um, uh, that's you know a point you quite often come to in a design process and someone has to make that sort of decision and it's not always democratic uh, but we just have to go through that it's a it's a way of working together i think and um after doing so many competitions um do you have uh do you develop some some guts feeling to say uh, yeah, this this design it's gonna be it's gonna be very good for this competition or this want and or it's always very very different in a matter of also a luck let's say. I think I think one starts to develop a gut feeling for if a design has a chance, you know, or or rather no, uh, I have to say it differently. I think you develop a gut feeling for. When it is when you actually know that what you're handing in will probably not win, um, uh, that's something you develop uh, because uh, you know you just you're into the project so much and you just you sort of get the feeling that you yeah it's it's something might be lacking a bit, but um, when you uh, but um, so vice versa you always know when you hand in a project that it's a good project, but um, it so varies on on the actual jury um, or your interpretation of the, of the, um, uh, of the project. Uh, it's, it's always, it's, it's virtually impossible to say if you have a good, if you have a good chance of winning, but it's easier to say if you don't have a good chance of winning. Yeah. I, I sort of put it like that. What do you think, Andreas? Um, yeah, I think I, I do not have. I, I didn't do enough competitions to to have the same gut feeling. But um, yeah, I think. Well, what's interesting here in the office is that we there's there's always competitions being done that you're not working on that you're not working on yourself. So you, you can observe the process they're doing. And uh, then I think when you look at the project that's being done by someone else, a competition that's being done by someone else, it's, it feels so easy to say if that's a winning 
that's a possibly possible winning project or not. And then when you're doing a project yourself, it's so much harder to have the same like precise feeling about it, like the objectivity. And that's, I guess, maybe that comes with experience. <laughs> we'll see in maybe 10 or 20 years. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just probably the most difficult task to look at your own work with like an external view. And um, I was curious also um, for building a, a team that works uh, for competitions and in general for someone to um, join your office. Um, is there something particular that... Uh, so what, what do you, you look general on a, in, in an application to someone that's willing to join uh, your, your office? And do you look purely at his um, professional skills or also try to understand more about if the personality is going to fit to the rest of the office? Um, well, there's always, I mean, there are always both elements. Um, when we uh, look for people, we um, uh, sometimes you looking specifically for people in later stages or 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 in earlier stages uh, of of a of a project, and um, so naturally the experience or the um, you know what they've done, uh, the quality of the work is is a is a very important part but also you know we're a, um we're still quite a uh, a small team even if we go up to 40 that's you know you know everybody so well in the office uh you know you go out for drinks at times and everything and and it's important that the person fits into a team we we do understand each other very much as a team you know we there's no big um hierarchy in in our office, uh, you know, we we all walk around, we all take coffee together and everything, and it's important that people like to work together. Uh, only if you enjoy working together, uh, you will you will create a good project, and all projects are created as a team and not as a single effort, so it's important that people fit in. And um, I was wondering, because uh, competitions is um, one of the... Um, part of the architectural process where very close and quick communication might be crucial because it's uh, lots of changes, lots, lot, a lot changes on a daily basis, and and there are a lot of uh, you know meetings where you are all together uh, sketching and drawing and discussing. Um, when I don't know how was the situation in Switzerland because I know that in general it's quite better than than the rest of Europe or from what I've heard. Um, did you have something set up when the pandemic kicked in? To did you need to work from home or you managed to stay in the office? How was that part of the year or right now? <laughs> You're waiting for me to answer the question. <laughs> well, I thought so. Yeah. Um, in, in spring, the, it wasn't mandatory to stay home for the employees, but it was like highly requested. And so most most people were working from home. And uh, I myself, I, I continued working in the office because I just, yeah, I, I, I didn't want to stay home all day and I, I'm going to work by bicycle. So um, I thought... There's no risk of like sitting alone in a in a big office with no one else, uh, apart from Christopher and my dad. <laughs> 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 so um, for me, there there wasn't much changing, but most people were at home. And then, uh, of course, there was also competitions running at the time. And finally, we lost the one that we did in the office, and we won one that was done at home. Um, so. From what I heard from my colleagues, it wasn't easy to do everything from home because, like, yeah, 
this this communication that you have basically all day long um, with with your team was was very intense and um but yeah in the end i guess they, they they went through a lot of work and it paid out so that yeah i well i can only speak for my colleagues who were working from home doing this competition that they, they it's not something they would like to have all the time um because it, i guess it's like an extra um an extra challenge um but but yeah it it somehow it somehow worked and and good results can be can be created yes i mean i would i would agree there there are certain um moments in a design process where it's so essential to be able to work on a very close knit basis and obviously it's difficult to do that you know during a pandemic um i think uh, in the first, well, you know, the first wave in spring, the pandemic didn't sw hit Switzerland. Uh, well, the German-speaking part of Switzerland as hard as as other places, and we were quite fortunate there. Now it's, you know, slightly different. Our numbers are quite high, but um, we have um, we have very generous space in the office, so we can sort of distribute people around a lot. It's not a, it's not very tight here, and. Um, so at the moment, actually, most people have decided to, you know, to keep on working in the office. We just, you know, we've got used to wearing masks all all day long and everything. And um, that is that is helpful. It is helpful. I wouldn't say that you can't, you, you know, you can't design. Um, obviously, it's, uh, it's maybe a generation thing or it's maybe something you just have to get used to. But... Um, uh, certainly the way I like to work or the way we, I think, sort of in general like to work, it's, it's, um, it's just so, it's just so helpful to have, especially in the early stages of a competition to have a very close knit relationship. Yeah. And, um, I'm curious also if you have had uh, uh, already before the pandemic, the options for, you know, occasionally do home office or, you implemented it right now and um if you think it's gonna be now if you're gonna be more comfortable now if like um i don't i don't know if permanent but if like um people occasionally maybe more often work for for from remote what what is your opinion in general about this remote work because i'm very curious um how different uh, architects perceive it because um yeah it was always supposed that if there is no a, a job which is done in an office where um home office is not possible is architecture so i'm very i'm very curious to, to know what is your opinion about it um i think i think our job has very different aspects and facets to it um quite a lot of the work you do can easily be done from home, but um, I think or there are also quite uh, a number of aspects where it's, I just think it's not possible to work from home. Um, that sort of goes in, especially into the design process. Um, many things you just have to do as a team. I mean, we always work as teams. I think everybody in architecture essentially works as teams. It's not, um, you know, it's not like uh, uh, if you do your own paintings and stuff, you always have clients, you always have different people uh, to communicate with. Um, but most importantly, you have your own fellow workers uh, in your own company and it's important to be in a, in, in a close-knit relationship. And I don't think um, a digital uh, relationship can actually um, enhance that. But... Having said that, there are many, many aspects you can easily do from home um, and you might be able to work a lot more concentrated as well. Yeah, I think about the concentration that's very individual because if you have like three kids also at home <laughs> which are <laughs> between uh, five and ten, I don't know, maybe it's not that easy. But um, Yes, absolutely, it, absolutely. It uh, also depends on the home you have, if you have a small home or big home. Um, but yeah, and um, I was I, I was curious uh, what kind of uh, 
uh, process uh, like you have in the office uh, in terms of uh, uh, software uh, and yeah, what is your like w literally working process? Uh, Georgi, I'll just quickly hand this over to Andreas. I'm, I just have to close the door and speak to the cleaning lady. I'll be right back. <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> well, in general, we're working on, on, on Windows and we mainly work in ARCHICAD as a, as a drawing software. Um, we work uh, more and more in, in 3D. So we do work on, if we work in a team, we work on a on a model, so we do work on the same on the same file, the same uh, um, CAD file. Uh, uh, it's called teamwork in ARCHICAD. So it's <clears throat> if we're in the office or if we're at home, it doesn't really matter. We the, the 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 workflow is still like the same, and it's very connected in in that sense that that. Uh, you, you cannot like open your own separate file and like do some little work during a whole day and then close it in the evening. You're always like connected to it with your team and then you have a like very straightforward um, uh, exchange. So that's that's like more on the on the software side. But then also we have like within a team we have weekly I, I would say at least two two times a team meeting where we exchange news and like stuff that needs to be done and we talk about uh design and and and, and everything and about upcoming meetings and um do you also build um physical models or and or for example the final uh physical models are built externally or and uh for example the whole uh visualizations you do because you have a uh, very beautiful visualizations on on your uh, Instagram feed and on your website. Uh, what about that? Um, yeah, we <clears throat> maybe first about the visualizations. We we do some visualizations uh, in house, but I think the ones you see on the home page or on Instagram, they are probably all done. Um, by professional companies and um, we have like a few favorites we like to work together but it's it's yeah we're not restricted to like one company um but yeah since we're drawing a lot in 3d it's easy to to to, to make images as well they just don't have the quality uh for for a competition hand in or for for a presentation uh, on the home page um, and about the, the physical models, I do, I do think we we all enjoy working with physical models, but it's well, it's it's maybe something we could um, do a bit more, or we could like push it a bit more, because I, well, at least personally, I think it's 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 it shouldn't be a privilege to be able to work with a physical model. Um, it's it's always helping a lot. And it's it's also a very enjoyable work, and uh, it's it's maybe it has more to do with reality. And um, yeah, I think it's yeah. We, maybe we should put some photos of physical models on our Insta post and Insta Insta feed. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> it, I think it, it, it does exist, but it's maybe not uh, always in the, the, the main focus in the office. I think one of the one of the most gratifying things on you know working with a physical model is that it just takes time to work with a physical model you know you have to you know build this thing and you have to put it in and it just takes time to to um to you know to manually do it and and that time gives you the opportunity to really think about uh, what you're actually doing and it's just not you know something you quickly do and then you scrub it out or you copy and paste stuff but it's just it's the it's the rhythm of working which is dictated by the manual working which is um, which i find is really really good yeah and I, I think that the physical model is always an an abstraction of your of of your design and 
it uh, it it pushes you to think about uh, the actual content of your design and, and and what you want to express with your building. And it, I think working in three D, there's like this danger that you lose yourself in details that are uh, not crucial to to your design. Uh, whereas when you work with a physical model, do you yeah, you have to understand, or it, it makes you understand the, the, the key points. And um, yeah, I think it's always very, very useful because um, you can see it in front of you. It's not like sometimes when you're in the digital space, you tend to zoom in, zoom out, and lose some uh, <laughs> some yes. orientation, so to say. Um, and, but I'm also uh, also curious if your how is your um, is your team uh, international? Because in, I was thinking about it that in your case, uh, international. It's uh, funny. It could be uh, Swiss people from different regions that spe- speak different languages because uh, it's a very unique country you're living in. Oh well, yes, absolutely, it is. Um, I mean, we have four, well, three main, but four official languages in Switzerland, and uh, uh, you have, uh, as you know well, because you, I mean, you've been living in Italy, you know well, you know the whole culture in the uh, Italian-speaking part of of, uh, of of Switzerland. We've got the French-speaking and the German-speaking part, and the uh, Romance part as well, which is a very small part. But no, it's. Um, I think these days, you know, most offices are international because there are so so many architects. <laughs> um, and if you, uh, you know, if you're looking for people, you will get applications from all over Europe, uh, which is a good thing. Um, uh, you know, we have uh, we've we've always had people from different nationalities working working in our office. Absolutely, I think um, that's very enriching. It's important, uh, but also something we do realize, especially if you're working in in the later stages of a project. It's it's just um, it's very very helpful if you know uh, a lot about the customs of a, a certain uh, country. If you know if you know about you know all the different you know laws and stuff. If you're able to do your own meetings and uh, speak to people, it's just it's just very very helpful. But uh, it doesn't it doesn't change the fact that it's uh, it's very enriching to work with people from different nationalities. Well, I think that um, on one side, architecture can be a very international um, profession because um, buildings are for humans and humans are the same size <laughs> uh, all around the world. and Roughly. Changes, <laughs> roughly the same size, <laughs> but I mean, we feel comfortable in the same size of Absolutely. buildings. <laughs> and um, changes, of course, the climate, but uh, that's something that you can adapt to. And on the other side, you have uh, all these different um, building processes which are strictly regulated in the in the field because, as you said before, we're not like painters or just artists. We're something which combines this invisible power of design and strict rules of security, safety, and... Uh, statics and I was wondering because I know very well the German the German construction process and I have had um, some guests from also the UK who have shared a little bit about um, the building process there um, how does it work in Switzerland uh, this this part this, the whole part and the whole st- sort of regulation um, <clears throat> yeah I think I can answer this since I was working on German projects when I was working in London. Um, and I think the the process in Germany is uh, very much comparable to, to Switzerland, or at least there is a much bigger difference between the UK and Germany than it is between uh, Germany and Switzerland. Um, I did get a feeling that uh, in Germany it's even more regulated in terms of building regulations than in Switzerland. It's it's probably hard to believe for Swiss architects if they when they hear that. <laughs> it's, in my opinion, it's a fact. And uh, 
yeah, I think that there is like a, there's a culture of, of having quite like working quite straightforward. Um, and I guess in, a, in, in every, in every design process or building process, there is this like, there's, there's a balance between, between uh, a, a reasonable balance, maybe I have to say between design and, and, um, costs and uh, regulations and, um, and uh, time schedules and, and so on. So there, it's, it's, yeah, we're not working as artists and we're not working as um, engineers either. I guess in both countries, it's that, that there's kind of a, a reasonable in between. And another thing I was wondering if now that you are, um, now that there's this whole pandemic going on and um, your whole office is based on, on joining competitions and then uh, eventually execute the whole building, is there some uh, dim diminishing, um, let's say, amount of competitions published or uh, it hasn't affected the market yet? And if you take part of more like public competitions, which are, I don't know, for public buildings or everything, whatever it comes on the, on the plate. Um, well, at the moment we've, uh, I mean, there has been a, a sort of a slight dip in the amount of competitions thrown on the market. Um, I think that's not actually due to the fact that the economy is stalling. I think it's just due to the fact, well, at the moment at least, it's difficult to say, but I think it's due to the fact that it's just taken um, more time to 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 actually be able to um, produce a program, you know, for a competition, to produce the financing for a competition. It's just taken more time due to the fact that we can't actually see each other at the moment and it's uh, very much more sort of digital. Um, so uh, especially in the public sector, uh, you know, the financing of a project and, you know, being able to uh, produce, I don't know, half a million Swiss francs for this, uh, for this one project has to go through a local parliament and stuff. And it's just, you know, it's just sort of um, uh, the system is just, been working a bit slower um so we've had a, a slight dip that there's still a fair amount of competitions coming out um uh, you can enter uh, we are hoping that there'll be more uh, coming soon as we all are i suppose uh, but um i mean generally speaking it, I, i i can't see um a very large effect this has had on our on our economy yet uh, but obviously we're all we're all a bit anxious that it that it will that it will take its toll at some certain time yeah i think that the field of architecture is like um we we're gonna it's it's like for for some businesses like i think about restaurants it's like uh mm, uh a a thunder and uh yeah. we're gonna and they see the lights we will see this we'll hear the sound in 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 some time so we don't know because of course it in in our business in our industry it takes time to make um a building so it's gonna come slower until uh, our clients will be like okay now we're gonna save save money on on this project and we won't do it now we will do it later when we're in a better better position that's true and, but on the i mean on the other hand um i mean i remember you know i mean during the financial crisis it was you know one day to another it was just a shutdown within about a month and uh that hasn't happened yet so you know we're still quite hopeful that it will that it will be good yeah i mean then now maybe we'll be more prepared yeah so it's not any more something that it's something that's going for a year now so almost so i think that um, yeah it's actually been a year hasn't it it's uh, it's a long time it's uh, a, a strange year <laughs> yeah it's it's a year since uh officially the first case but 
Uh, yeah, it, it's uh, so, so funny to look back at uh, the time before COVID when people were like, in the beginning of the COVID, I was thinking it's going to be something that's going to last, I don't know, a month. Maybe yeah. talking about this virus, I'm wearing China and that's it. But it ended up to be the opposite. And, oh, I have um, a funny story there. I mean, I have a, I have a friend, here, a very good friend here in Bern. He has, a, he has quite a large restaurant. And uh, when when this whole thing first came up, sort of, you know, when it started in Italy and everything, um, he was a bit anxious and a bit worried. And I sort of said at the time, I said, oh, come on, you know, it, in three months, we won't even know what it's called anymore. <laughs> so I was very, very wrong there. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I don't know how to view Georgi, but I, it seems these days... One of the most nerve-wracking thing about this is that, well, no, that's not putting it right, but one of the things that, that really gets to me is that every single conversation we have, at, at some point you always end up talking about the pandemic. And it's it's really a topic I would really rather like to avoid at, at some times, but obviously, you know, it's important and, and, you know, we need to talk about it. Uh, and and it's I don't think that our conversation was uh, very focused on the pandemic. The pandemic no, was no, um, yeah. was um, sliding in sometimes, but it's just because uh, m- more or, more or less um, affects the the regular day life of the whole world currently. So absolutely, no. You, I mean, you're so right there. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and it was interesting to know how it affects uh, also your profession to hear from other architects because mm-hmm. also you're a very um, peculiar kind of uh, practice because you're so focused on competitions and uh, you, I, I guess you have a sort of a quicker pace than uh, other offices <laughs> because... Um, as I say, oh, we'd um, love to. I mean, we'd love to think that, and it's a it, it's a very <laughs> nice compliment. Thank you very much. But one thing that I found very interesting is that uh, I don't know uh, if you were talking about that uh, before, but um, uh, it's it, it, it. I mean, this whole thing has had a surge in our digital relationships, and there are some things that um, have remained that I think are very good like all these sort of hybrid meetings. And um, we were, you know, quite sort of traditional in the way we organized meetings before. And now, um, you know, we, we're just used to having a certain amount of people here physically and uh, many others, you know, on the actual screen. And it's um, it's enhanced the way we work. It's uh, it's good, you know. We can work with engineers from all over Switzerland, and they don't have to actually travel to Bern, but they can stay in their offices. And it's just become a very normal thing, which is uh, which is very good. Um, it uh, it makes the the you know the actual meetings more precise, quicker. Uh, that's something I actually really enjoy. I, I think this is something positive that's going to stay because uh, it's just, you know, uh, it's sort of we've been forced to use more of these new possibilities for meetings. I, I don't mean like, uh, for example, team-wise, it's okay to go to your office in, on a daily basis. But, uh, for example, you know, sometimes you have a meeting just for one hour and you have to travel to another city and you need to spend, I don't know, three hours to go there and to come back and then you're tired and uh you also you know consume resources in 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 um energy and emissions which are not good for the environment and now when everybody have sort of uh adopted these new ways and now it's kind of normal for everybody it's not anymore outrageous to say let's do i don't know a Skype meeting or team meeting or uh, some sort of video call. Yes, I mean, I agree completely. And we're such a, you know, the, I mean, this whole architectural sector is, is so digitalized anyhow, you know, and we just, we all work on computers. We're all so used to working with models, 3D models. We put lots of information into the models and, you know, we can actually have very complex discussions on the on the tv screen and uh you know we can be sitting anywhere and that's uh that's a good thing and i think this uh, this has really pushed pushed this form of communication and and uh, 
in certain in certain periods of a of a project or of a design process, it's uh, it's good and it's very helpful. And I was wondering, what are also the um, green building standards and requirements in Switzerland? Because um, is it a very important topic in your process? Because in my imagination, Switzerland is also uh, maybe, I don't know, I imagine it in the level of Scandinavia, sort of a very, very green country or a part of the regulations uh, that are of course mandatory to follow do you have some sort of instant like for example in, in Italy there is a system uh, a system of um you know tax return incentives to build greener buildings uh, and some sort of european well, Switzerland is not part of the european union but also in Italy there are european union money to to make people will to to build greener what is the setup in switzerland in this topic um well the the the, 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 the setups maybe christopher can answer more precisely more in a general sense i think um there there is more and more going on in terms of changing uh, how we how we build and how we how we uh, use buildings or how we renovate buildings as well. But uh, I, I think Switzerland in a general sense is rather far away from being a role model. And in the same time, Switzerland could quite be quite easily uh, a role model because we're like the, the topics are on the table and I think the problems are on the table. And also many solutions are on the table, but this, it's being discussed quite controversially, I think. And it's, it just needs or takes a lot of time and effort to, to change um, given things. And so, of course, we do have uh, regulations that are getting more strict and we do have funds from the state and, uh, and, and, and the regions. If we do, if, if you do build um, like in a greener way, let's say, but uh, it, it, it could it could be much much more restrictive and, and much much uh, more to the point, so that it would have a much bigger effect. Um, yeah, I'm um, I'm not sure if I agree completely, but I do know what Andreas is meaning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Switzerland is a very small country, and it's a country that has I. Uh, you know, I'd say a, a, a fairly high standard of education. Um, so if we if we put this in, we sh you know we should be a lot further than we actually are. Uh, we have, uh, as most countries, uh, in terms of you know green effects, we have a, um, an urban and a rural conflict here in Switzerland. I, you know, most uh, cities, most towns in Switzerland are are run by. Uh, uh, sort of leftish, more greenish sort of politicians. So obviously, it's a big, big thing. Uh, there are lots of incentives. You know, you get lots of tax returns if you change your heating systems, if you uh, insulate your houses and everything. And it's it has become a very big factor also in in the way we design and in the way um, we we build we build our houses which is good it's an important thing it's actually i think one of the main main tasks we have we have at the moment also in architecture is um how you know how do we build eco-friendly houses um that still have the capability of reacting to very local circumstances um, I think that's a very, very important and very poignant question uh, that we don't just have solar panelled houses everywhere, uh, but we, you know, uh, we we have um, very eco eco friendly houses. It's, uh, I mean, for instance, we were Andreas and I with others were just in a competition for a, a large office building here in Switzerland. Well, here in Berna, actually. Um, well, large-ish. It was, you know. 400 uh, working uh, spaces plus lots of meeting rooms and we we that was the main theme of our design uh, was to build something that 
at uh, an office building that doesn't have a heating system and it doesn't have a cooling system and it's uh, it has a, a positive um, energy uh, you know sort of uh, uh, scale um, so I think it's an important thing and it's uh, it's something that has really come up and it's uh, it's uh, no question it's the 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 most important issue we have in this day and age and do you as a as an office as a long experience in in architecture in general um do you have some you both of you if you have some per, uh, favorite subject uh you would like to work on what is your favorite um kind of do you have a favorite type of of uh, buildings you like to to design which you have found very exciting and or if you, if there is any build, uh, competition you already took part where you think this is definitely the the highlights of of your work so far I mean, for Andreas, probably is the train station <laughs> because he mentioned it a couple of times. So it's. I'm not. I'm not so sure about that, but no, still. <laughs> I, 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 I wouldn't. I couldn't say there's like a, uh, a main topic that I, I like to work on, or like a, 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 a main building type. Um, I do know that I like to work in. Uh, two buildings that have an effect on, on public space. I do think that the exchange between between public space and uh, and uh, and the building that's that's where where you can achieve a lot, where you can uh, make a difference, and where um, you can design something that affects not only the user but but also um, a bigger scale. Yes, I mean I think I I agree with that. Um... Uh, it's uh, working on a building that has a, an impact on public space is is uh, it's a big thing. It's a it, it's a big thing. But I myself can also not say that I'd have a certain type. I I put it differently. There's a a certain setting in a project that you really need to have. Um, you need to be able to work with a client who has a an understanding of architecture um knows what the importance of architecture can be and what it can what it can portray but also um uh, uh you know it just uh, has an appreciation of the work you're doing i think that's a setting but that that can be in anything it can be in the in the smallest refurbishment up to a, a large a large building with a big impact on on uh, public space it's uh, it's difficult to say uh, that's one of the wonders of our profession that you can uh, you can work on so many different scales and it's it's uh, it's a very gratifying thing to uh, to live yeah I, it's a very interesting point of view i've, I've never told about uh, the setup uh, what you, the, this um sentence you just said um and uh andreas you 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 were the the person i communicated to before we started uh uh before we even agreed on, on making the podcast um you do also something about the communications of the office or uh it's that just your uh, side task beside beside your old projects you're doing um it, it is a bit of a smallish side task that i um, running the Instagram account, um, the, yeah, even the website and and other channels are in in other people's hands. So it's yeah, I don't think we can talk about like a communication task. It's it's um, yeah, I think the the, the the Instagram account it's a newish thing for the office. <coughs> uh, we decided uh, just a few months ago to to start it. Um, to to have a bit of a bigger appearance in, in in public and to to attract maybe more ideally to attract more uh, people to the office. 
Yeah, but Andreas is a, he's he's a very very good communicator. Not only in Instagram, but he also I mean he's the one who gets to stand at pub and you know we all go for drinks and everything. So that's an, <laughs> that's a very important factor of his job. <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah. So um, I guess that. Uh, um m- more and more it's uh, becoming uh, interesting to communicate online because it connects uh n- you know new people maybe future clients also me because if i uh if you wouldn't have uh, had uh instagram i i might have get to know about you so i think it's uh, an interesting medium and opportunity also for for many architects uh, especially because it's uh you know the result of our work is so uh visual for for everybody and everybody can uh, enjoy a nice building even if they don't have a technical understanding about it um but um i'm i don't want to i don't want to keep you on uh longer because we have a very long and great conversation about many subjects it was very interesting to to get to know someone from switzerland i have so far never had the opportunity to talk to to swiss architects with uh also with a background as yours which is uh, i can hear in your accents very british uh so <laughs> as a conclusion of our chat uh whoever is listening to this podcast you can shout out a little bit where where can they go find on internet uh your your office and uh and check your work themselves <laughs> sorry we should shout it out <laughs> you have to cut out that little bit <laughs> andreas i think i think that's your that, that's your job as the communications manager here oh yeah especially <laughs> Well, no, definitely. Andreas, you can yeah. shout it out so Christoph, Christopher yeah. can go himself to check the Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we're happy about everyone checking out our new Instagram account, um, our website. And, of course, the best way to, to, to get to know the office is to either visit the buildings or the office itself. And uh, I can, I will also, of course, uh, insert in the in the description of the podcast the links to our to your uh, social media and to your website, so that uh, people can uh, check um, the Bureau B, their projects, uh, and co- even if you're interested in contacting them for uh, job openings or for inquiries, everything is a great opportunity. And I can uh, tell myself that, uh, uh, Christopher, you don't like this topic, but uh, as soon as traveling is a little easier, I'm going to come old school in person to, to Switzerland to visit your office if it's, uh, if it's possible. <laughs> well, that would be lovely. I was just going to say, it was, it, it was great talking to you. It's, uh, well, obviously, it's your job to ask us questions, and uh, I think uh, I, I you know, from from the way you ask and from the way you conduct your interview, uh, it's it's easy to say that you have uh, a very uh, interesting background yourself, and it would be it would be fun to meet you in person and you know uh, to show you our our work, um, uh, to show you our offices, and you know to, um, to yeah, I mean to see each other. It was uh, it, it was a good thing. Thank you very much. And to show you our favorite bar just around the corner. Oh yes. Yeah, Andreas, you'll be you'll be um, the one uh, the person responsible for <laughs> the drinks, <laughs> and um, yeah, because you, you you're apparently very as Christopher said, you you have a great knowledge about it, and uh, yeah, it's it's gonna be nice to to talk to you in person, and I I have a pretty pretty portable portable gear, so by then I can. We can do a, a second podcast in, in in person, which will be much nicer than than the online version for sure. Oh, absolutely! And uh, I mean, Frankfurt's not far away anyhow. And uh, but if you come, you have to come in summer. Bern is a really really good place, uh, you know, to come anyhow. It's a it's a fun city and it's a, it has a good size. 
and uh, there's a river running through Bern. And in summer, it's very custom to go and swim in the river. It's a uh, it's a great thing. It's like a a very long park with lots of pop up you know bars and stuff. And you know we all go swim in the river. Um, so make sure you come then. I'll be coming. So thank you very much, and have a good evening, you both. Thank you, Georgi. You too. You too. Have a good evening.